A giant step toward dignity and full participation in American life and affairs was taken by the American Negro in the capital of the United States on the day of August 28, 1963. The step was taken solemnly and in union with many of their white countrymen. The footstep of the march in Washington was firm, with a quiet purpose and a mannerly rhythm. It aroused, even in dissenters, a larger awareness of the right of the Negroes as Americans to share equally not only the sun and air so clear and free on the day of their march, but their right as Americans to share opportunity and privilege as well. America has known this intellectually for a long time for 100 years by history's calendar. On August 28th, America learned this emotionally, with clarity more penetrating than intellect. Every kind and class, every generation of America participated. If not in the city of Washington, across the land by television, America mutely attended the feeling of the march and heard the all-encompassing cry for freedom from indignity. America heard back into the miles of her history to Lincoln, Jefferson, Tom Paine, Patrick Henry. Everybody attended the march in Washington of August 28th. In this city that has a massive traffic problem even in normal times, traffic had been rerouted and acres of space had been reserved for the buses that brought the thousands of visiting demonstrators. Momentum for the march began slowly. By 11.30 a.m., a mounting tide of children, students, parents, grandparents, placards and banners held aloft were walking down the wide avenue named in honor of the Constitution of the country. No attempt was made or thought given to strict lines of marching. The mood of the day was serious, but relaxed. 200,000 strong they marched in the largest demonstration for civil rights in the history of the United States.
Catholics, Protestants, and Jews. The humble and the famous. Westerners, Northerners, and Southerners. A cross-section of the 50 states were represented as they progressed along the avenue, loosely grouped together by states or organizations or busloads. Some arrived by roller skates, some by train and plane. Some drove private automobiles 30, 50 miles. All now walked to the memorial site preserved in honor of Abraham Lincoln. They walked to express to the nation in a peaceful fashion their rights to freely assemble and be heard, as spelled out in the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. The First Amendment requires that the government not only refrain from interference with peaceful assemblies, it must restrain the restrainers as well. The Boston Tea Party led off a long chain of effective social protests in America. The suffragette demonstrations spread to many cities before their cause was victorious. And the struggles of American labor were traditionally advertised through the right to peacefully assemble and be heard. A renowned American jurist recently said, a function of free speech under our system is to invite dispute. It may strike at prejudices and preconceptions and have profound unsettling effects as it presses for acceptance of an idea. give you Mr. Burt Lancaster.
Americans traveling no matter where in the world today are in the position of ambassadors and are very often made bitterly aware of our country's reputation. It is not easy to be an American abroad, nor is it easy to make coherent to those who are not Americans the nature and the meaning of our struggle. And we are therefore forever indebted to those Americans represented by the March on Washington movement for giving us so stunning an example of what America aspires to become and for helping us to redefine in the middle of this dangerous century what is meant by the American Revolution. We recognize that it is not only in America that the battle for freedom and dignity of peoples is being waged. The struggle toward freedom on the part of the previously subjugated is occurring in capitals and villages all over the world. It is on our awareness of what this struggle means and in the degree of our dedication to it that our future and the future of the world depend. One hundred fifty members of the Congress of the United States arrived at the rally to add their support and the support of the people of the states they represent to the spirit of the march in Washington. of civil rights in America. Mr. Roy Wilkins, Executive Secretary, National Association for the Advancement of the I want some of you to help me win a bet. I want everybody out here in the open to keep quiet. And I want to hear a yell and a thunder from all those people who are out there under the trees. Let's hear you. Yeah. Yeah. There's one of them in the tree. As the Freedom Marchers remained at the Monument Grounds to close their demonstration in prayer, their leaders moved on to the White House to meet with President Kennedy.
The president's active concern with the progress for the Negro in housing, education, and employment is well known. The members of the overall policy committee of the March in Washington reported the conference was friendly and cooperative. Chairman A. Philip Randolph reports first. We believe that it's going to have its effect on the image of our country all over the world because it will indicate that not only are Negroes struggling to achieve a transition from second class to first class citizenship, but that our white brothers and sisters are marching arm in arm with the Negro citizens of the country for the purpose of achieving this objective. And consequently, this is and has been a great American experience. The Reverend Dr. Eugene Carson Blake, United Presbyterian Church of the United States of America, was another of the march leaders. The was right. The thing we wanted to do was to get in behind the leadership of the Negro community. Clearly, the religious leader of this occasion was Martin Luther King. And uh, we are proud to have served behind and strengthening the witness that he's been carrying. The other thing is that we did produce a non-segregated march. Mr. Walter Ruther of the United Auto Workers of America was also a member of the committee that met with President Kennedy. And I believe that the real significance of what we have started here today is that we have laid the groundwork for the building of a functioning broad coalition of Americans from all walks of life, from all points of view, from all races and creeds and color, who can carry on not only the common struggle to achieve an effective and meaningful civil rights legislation, but who can do this practical work, the day-to-day -day job of fighting discrimination in education, in housing, in employment, in public accommodation. And I think this is the true significance of what we have started today. Pleasure now to present the moral leader of our nation, one who has conducted a massive moral campaign in the southern area of the nation against the citadel of racism, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Thank you, Mr. Randolph. I would simply like to say that I think this has been one of the great days of America. And I think this march will go down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, demonstrations for freedom and human dignity ever held in the United States. Uh The slumbering conscience of America stood aroused, tall and awakened, as twilight fell over the march in Washington of August 28th. It admitted a lingering sense of shame. It admitted pain had been overlooked. In so doing, America reminded herself of her destiny, her aspirations, the dream which brought forth her birth. And America turned her eyes full upon the issues of freedom and justice, issues for all. She turned her attention to the Civil Rights Bill before the Congress, which is currently under examination of the elected representatives of all the towns and cities of the land. She turned her thoughts to the job ahead. The sound and spirit of the massive reminder of the meaning of freedom traveled around the world on the day of August 28th, rightfully initiating from the grounds where Abraham Lincoln sits silently and gravely, watching over this land from the memorial erected to his memory. The U.S. is reminded it is not enough to hope together, to pray together. She is reminded she must speak and act for the common good.